Hello everyone, welcome back to Maverick Mods. Changing gears a little bit this week, gonna work on the Chevy pickup, just for a change of pace. Two major focus points in uh, this week's video. One is disassembling the Trailblazer. Wait, what? Those of you that saw episode one fig uh, learned that I bought a Trailblazer SS as a donor vehicle so I could get the LS2 from that vehicle. And so the Trailblazer came in the shop and got torn apart. I've gotten everything off of it I need to get. And so I'm gonna you know, just detail some of the highlights of that. Second part of the video, I'm sizing the pickup here for wheels and tires. And you might ask why wheels and tires when I haven't even started disassembling the truck yet. And the answer is, well, it's kind of simple. Kind of two part. Part one is, well, it's holiday season and a lot of stuff's on sale. If I can save a couple hundred bucks, hundred bucks on tires, why not? And the second part is, it actually helps me plan some of the, especially the suspension and drivetrain options that are available to me if I've got wheels and tires already kind of sized for the build. So that's pretty much what's going to happen this week. So strap in, grab your popcorn, and uh, let's get started. Oh, before we do, it, it seems that the, uh, you know a lot of the guys that do builds on the internet, on YouTube, they tend to name their projects. Uh, I never really have done that. The only car that I remember that ever got a name was, um, I had a 2004 Corvette when I lived in Dubai. It wound up getting a name but that's a, that's a story for a different day. So, uh, you know what? I dub the Barney. Tell me what you think. All right, let's get started. Got the Trailblazer in the shop, ready for disassembly. I'm just gonna hit the highlights on this, but we can start off if I can do this one-handed. Oh. Am I getting the engine cover off? I'll do a little bit of uh, detail as I uh, get the engine out, tear things down. The only real difference between this and the Corvette motor, it's got a truck intake on it. And my understanding, which I haven't really seen yet, is it's got, the Trailblazer has a unique oil pan, which is a front sump pan which is going to have to go, and I'll probably wind up having to either get a truck pan or a uh, F-body pan to fit the 72 Chevy. Other than that, I'm going to take a few things apart, and we'll uh, look at some highlights as I get uh, this thing disassembled. Wish me luck. I successfully demated, divorced, divulged, dissected, whatever you want to call it, the engine transmission from the Trailblazer. Just a couple of quick items on uh, this particular combination. The Trailblazer, uh, at least the V8 applications, uh, especially this one, are unique to uh, all of the, the standard LSs. The oil pan is actually a front sump pan. And I guess, although this particular Trailblazer is a two-wheel drive, 
all of the oil pans have provisions for four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, whatever you want to call it. So there's actually a hole that goes right through the middle of the pan there. So uh, this oil pan might actually have a little bit of value, but it's got to go away. So I uh, will do some uh, test fitting to see if I can use a standard truck pan or if I need to get a, uh, an F-body pan. It's pretty standard otherwise. It's got, uh, let's see, where is it? Two forty-three heads, basic. They're, they're the cathedral ports on the Gen threes. Uh, the O six is kind of bridges between a Gen three and a Gen four. I don't uh, even pretend to be an LS expert. I'm still learning. There's tons of channels out there where guys know a lot more about these than I do. What else have we got? Uh, I think I read somewhere that the exhaust manifolds are unique to the Trailblazer, and a lot of guys want these things, uh, evidently, because of the um, uh, kind of hug the, the block a little bit better than the standard exhaust manifolds. I'm going to check on that, but I'm putting headers on this. So if anybody needs a set of LS exhaust manifolds, and if the Trailblazer manifolds are what you need, I've got a set. The... Drive shaft yoke is actually stuck in the tail shaft, and so I took the drive shaft itself off just by banging out the U joint end caps. I've got to work on trying to get this out. Like I said it's it does rotate, so everything you know kind of still works in there. It's just that this is stuck in there, and I got to figure out how to get that out. I don't know if that actually caused any damage farther up in the transmission. Again, we'll have to see. I'm going to see if I can't get this yoke out. As part of the accident, it jammed the yoke up in. And I don't know exactly why, but for lack of a better term, we're going to just take a big hammer, see if we can knock it off. Trying not to damage the tail housing in the process. Hopefully I don't. Got it. I'm going to pull this seal off real quick. See if I can see any visible damage to the output shaft. I'm looking here at the output shaft. I don't see any vis anything visible. There's anything that just jumps out at me, but I'll bet you there's something boogered up on this output shaft. But for the deal I got for this uh, whole package, doing a rebuild on this transmission is in the budget. Fellas, the Trailblazer is about to go away. I've taken everything off of it that I can possibly think of that I can need. The only thing engine transmission, etc., related I left was the fuel tank. And I did some measuring. My initial thought was, you know, it'd be pretty nice maybe to throw this fuel tank in the C10 pickup and mount it inside of the frame rail. Uh, nice, easy solution. Unfortunately, it just won't fit. The frame rails on the Trailblazer are uh, inside inside are 37 inches and the fuel tank is 16 inches on the Chevy pickup inside the fuel rails are only uh, in, excuse me inside of the uh, frame rails is only 30 inches which means that this fuel tank is too wide so I'll have to go back to the original um, mount behind the rear axle uh, after or not aftermarket uh, blazer fuel tank other than that interior wise Boy, is she stripped down. And pretty much everything from the front seats forward, I went ahead and took just in case. Except the one thing I'm not going to take, or I can't take, or I could, but why, is the electronic throttle. And, of course, I need that for the drive-by wire throttle body. 
but this has this weird connection to the brake pedal which has to do with traction control and of course I'm not putting that tra I can't put that traction control on the Chevy pickup so I'm just gonna leave this I can do one of two things I can buy an electronic throttle same pin configuration same connector configuration so I know there's not an issue there I can buy a an electronic throttle pedal assembly for about hundred and thirty bucks or I can buy a cable operated throttle body for about a hundred and fifty bucks so there's solutions there that are doable or I could go to a junkyard find a vehicle that does not have traction control or whatever this weird setup is and just take the throttle pedal so I can do that uh, let's see other oddball kind of things I've got a pile of parts here I may or may not use either now or on a future build and I tend to kind of try and save some of that stuff the one thing I'm not gonna save is as much as I'd like to this uh, HVAC box uh, of course it's designed to fit the trailblazer but here's a problem I don't know if you guys have ever actually had to replace one of these, but years ago, I had a 93 Corvette that this little electronic blend door actuator failed on. And I'm not kidding, fellas. It took me three days of unbelievable, strenuous work, and I can't tell you how many busted knuckles just to try and replace that blend door and i eventually had to create a tool to get it out uh, because they put it in a completely inaccessible location so let's take a look at this hvac box there's one there's two there's three there's four there's another one around here somewhere there's five, and I think there's one down here in the bottom. I thought there was another one. Maybe not. Okay. There are five of those electric blend door actuator motors on this HVAC box. Now, keep in mind, this is a dual climate zone box, so it's a little bit more complex than your standard box. Still, I, I cannot imagine me doing anything so complicated that I would use this moving on this is the pile of seat belts that came out of the Chevy pickup when I pulled the seat out I I'm I'm really really hesitant to reuse these Now, I think maybe I need new seat belts. Alright, I did pull the steering wheel off and the seat out of the pickup. Going to do a little cleaning in here. And believe it or not, what I'm doing is I'm just creating a little bit of room so that my big pile of parts that I'm saving for the, for the pickup will actually all fit within the pickup, just to keep the space in the shop under control. It's a little cleaner, lots of Georgia clay, lots of old acorns, found a few more rust spots, pulled a 45 pound mouse nest from back behind here, and that just kind of opened up the ventilation in the back there. That's that cab corner I looked at before, and I found a rust spot here that I didn't see before, but no problem, I can patch that. I'm going to throw the trailblazer seats in here and the center console, basically just to get them out of the way. We'll take a look at that when I'm done. 
Those dang seats are heavy. Wish I had a set of scales here. I, obviously, they're just kind of plopped in here for now. They're just kind of sitting there. But the interesting thing about these seats is it solves my seatbelt problem because it's all integrated in the seat. Score. That's a good bonus. Anyway, this will be the home for the seats and the center console and some of the interior pieces for the next little while while I work on uh, other parts of the project and other projects. Oh, I guess I ought to try and suck the mouse nest out of the glove box. Well, I couldn't help myself. I went ahead and propped the seats up with a couple blocks of wood just to kind of get them a little bit closer to the final set, the position they're going to set in. I have not removed the old fuel tank yet, so I can't get the seats quite as far back as their final position. But with the seats and center console on here, it's kind of give you an idea of just what this thing is going to look like when everything's in. Let's do a quick inventory of everything I got off the Trailblazer. Not all of this is going to wind up going in uh, in Barney here, but I'm hoping the majority of it can. So, needless to say, we've got the LS2 Trailblazer intake. You know, everything I've read about that says that's a pretty darn good intake. It's kind of ugly, but, you know, it's better than a lot of the aftermarket stuff out there. I don't know if I'm going to keep that or not yet. Uh, 4L70E, which has a potential issue with uh, when the yoke got smashed up in there. I don't know. I may see if I can horse trade that and just get a 4L80E. Uh, let's see. I took as many of the fuel lines, air conditioner, compressor lines, just all kinds of lines. You never know when you, what you might need. I took the front and rear uh, rotors and calipers and the backing plates for the rear. That's all sitting back here. I'm hoping I can use them. If not, well, you know, if I could have and didn't keep them, then, you know, then I'd never know. I didn't take the fuel tank itself, but I did take the fuel pump. Don't know if I can adapt that to uh, uh, a different style tank or not. Not real sure. Uh, Speedway Motors to the rescue again. Again, not a sponsor, but this is an LS engine stand. Gonna give that a try. I did buy the wheels and tires. Though again, for the fronts, they're 245, 45, 20s. The rears are 315, 35, 20s. In my little containers here, I've got wiring harnesses. I've got interior components. I've got a bunch of the stuff I stripped out of the interior of the Trailblazer. Again, in the front, I took a bunch of the interior parts and pieces. I always try and take as much of the ductwork as I can, not because it might adapt over, but because you never know when you might be able to cut and section just a small piece of it to make something else fit. Of course, we've got the interior. Uh, the seats and the center console that definitely is going in Barney here and sitting up on my shelf up there a whole bunch of other stuff I took the dash don't know if I can use it but I'm gonna try steering column uh, I did go ahead and keep the HVAC unit if I can't use it here maybe I can use it on something else so I basically took and will keep and try and adapt as much as possible for the uh, build here Having a complete and intact and, well, running vehicle uh, opens up some options that I didn't have on my uh, first build on the channel, which is the Firebird, which allows me to kind of plan things differently. And one of the things I can do, which we couldn't really do on the Firebird, is I can get wheels and tires fairly soon, which opens up some, uh, well, it doesn't open up, it, it clarifies some options that I might need to think about down the road. One of the things I can do is figure out what size tires and what wheels I can use on Barney here. 
After some measuring and some sitting back and scratching my head, kind of looking things over, I think I've come up with um, what I'm hoping is a good tire combination. So I'm gonna start off with the rear here and just give you an idea. My rear tires, uh, let's find the sticker. I'm hoping I can use are 31535ZR20s. Front tires 245-4520. Uh, it's obviously these things are um, uh, 35 series. They are, call it 12 and a half inches wide. Height wise, I believe they're 28 inches. Yeah, they're 28 inches, which is basically about a half inch taller than the factory uh, tires that came stock on the uh, truck here. So basically, yeah, these things are essentially 27, call it 27 and a half. So the idea is I want a tire and a wheel and tire package that doesn't overwhelm the wheel well, but at the same time, it's big enough. Like in this case, if you look, that wheel well obviously is quite a bit bigger than the tire itself. Now, part of that is because the tire is recessed quite a bit into the well, but part of it is just from a visual perspective, the tire could stand to be bigger. However, it can't stand to be much bigger. So that's kind of what I was going for there. I'm hoping that the width will bring it out Lowering the truck will also help, but just enough to fill the wheel well a little bit better. So to check to see if the wheels and tires fit, or actually the tires fit, and to find out what wheels I need, I'm going to use my... Now, those of you who've watched the channel for a while might remember that I bought a nice little gadget from Speedway Motors. Not a sponsor. Uh, this is a tire wheel combination checker tester thingy. Um, it's not the first time I've used it. I actually used it on the Firebird, uh, and I filmed myself using it on the Firebird, but I did such a really, really horrendous job of demonstrating the product that Speedway Motors, if they had, if I had published it, probably would have called me up and said, just send it back, we'll give you your money back, please don't put anything out like that ever again. I'm going to try again this time, and maybe I can do a little better job. Okay. With the tire off, I can explain kind of what's going on. I'm going to put my checker up in here with the tire mounted. And what I'm really looking for, obviously, is does it fit the wheel well, which I know it will. I want to check for clearance on my fender well, or the lip of my fender. I also need to check for clearance at the inner portion of the wheelhouse itself. Now, we know that my tire is 12 and a half inches wide. I've got 14 inches to the lip of the fender, or the bedside, what I'm going to call it. That doesn't really give me a whole heck of a lot of room because obviously I've got a little bit of lip up in here too. And that actually concerns me a little bit, but it doesn't really concern me because I had intended to replace the wheel houses and they make a set that's deeper for wider tires. So I'm not worried there. I can't check it today though, because I, I can't remove the wheelhouse because I still have the part of the bed here that would be in the way. So just removing the wheelhouse to give me clearance doesn't do any good because the bed floor is actually in the way too. So I'll just do the best I can with what I've got right now. So now to the fun part. How does this thing work? Okay, from a basic standpoint, here we go. So you've got, this is all based on a five lug pattern. They make a separate one for a six lug, I'm assuming for a four lug also. But for a five lug pattern, it's got v multiple uh, bolt pattern or size patterns pre-drilled into it. So you can go anywhere from four and a half, four and three quarter, there's another four and three quarter, five inch, uh, five and a half. So I'm going to be using five because the wheels or the uh, bolt pattern on the uh, on Barney here is a five on five. So I'll be using these holes to get your wheel diameter. You've got a bunch of different options here that you just take your 
uh, wing nuts loose and you can slide both ends up and down to correspond with the actual wheel diameter. And you can see right here on the back side, it gives you different from anything from 14. This side goes to 20 and you can flip it around. You can go all the way up to a 22 inch wheel if you so desire, which I don't since I'm looking at 20s, I'm set at 20. So I've got both sides set at 20. That's one part of the contraption. The second is this little bracket right here, which is what actually holds the tire. Okay. So this can sit right on top of the center part. And this will hold the wheel itself. So the beads of the, of the tires and the wheel, excuse me, sorry, not the wheel, the tire itself. And the bead of the tire will sit in these slots right here. And of course that's adjustable as well. And so you can kind of slot it in and hold it in. You do that both sides, and that'll hold the wheel in place. What this will allow you to do is mount the tire exactly in location, and then you can check all your clearances on the rear. We talked about that on the front. I can actually check suspension travel. I can check clearance at the, in the, the inner fender well, uh, things like that. So let me go ahead and get this put together, and let's get the tire mounted up. So I've got a 12 inch wide wheel, so I need to set my bracket, the end of it, so it goes to 11, that'll be 12 at the end. So I set it right there, and although I don't want to lock it permanently in yet, because this is going to hold the bead of the tire itself. So let me go ahead and get this stuck in here, and we'll lock this, up, lock this in. So... I'm going to set my bottom first. Doesn't have to be completely precise, but uh, enough for you to get the picture. And we'll set the top. Alright. Now that's in on that side. We do the other side. Next I need to put my center in. But I gotta think about this for a minute before I really go too all fired crazy. One of the things I have to keep in mind is wheel offset or backspacing. So the scale that's on these actually serves a dual function. One is to set the diameter, or excuse me, one is to set the width of the wheel, but the other will help you determine offset. I'm gonna set this up and then I'll show you when we get it on the truck. And I'm going to start off by setting this at essentially zero offset, which would also be on a 12 inch wide wheel, would be six inch backspacing. So what I need to do is I need to set, now I've got this set up so that the back of my plate is also the face of the spindle or the face of the brake drum. So that's where the offset or the back spacing will be measured from. So that basically corresponds to the top edge of this part of the piece here. So I'm going to set that you can see the six right here. I'm going to set that at six on both sides. Close enough. I'll put my wing nuts on, lock this in, and what that will simulate is a 20 by 12 wheel with zero offset or six inch backspacing, which is the same thing. Go ahead and mount it up. Find my five on five. Actually hitting what am I hitting on? I'm hitting on my brackets. Okay. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. Woo! Well, oh well. 
Well, that's broken. I don't even want to know what that is. And we're just going to pretend we didn't see anything inside of here. Now I should be able to get my tire off. Let's try this again. Only difference is I'm going to lose just the thickness of the brake drum itself. In the grand scheme of things, not that big a deal yet. It will be eventually, but by the time I get to the point where this is uh, brake setup is configured the way I want, I'll be able to lock in my wheels a little bit better. So as you can see, it allows you to put the tire in the uh, mounted just like it would if there was a wheel there. But now what I can do is uh, I can play with the suspension travel, which on the rear, as I explained, I'm not going to do. I will on the front, but not on the rear yet. But it also kind of gives me an idea. I can back up a little bit. And even though it's uh, jacked off the ground right now, this can give me an idea of what that tire is going to look like on the vehicle. So, I mean, it fills the wheel well better than the original one did. I suspect when I'm done lowering this thing, it's probably going to be a little bit lower than this. But what I can do now with this checker is I can check my offset or my backspacing to see what works best. So let's take a look at that next. So first thing I'm going to take a look at is let's get underneath and see. Now you can see with a zero offset or six inch backspace wheel, my tire is touching the wheelhouse. We obviously don't want that, but at the same time, I do intend to put wider wheelhouses on, which will give me, uh, I think you can get one that's two inches and one that's four inches. I think I'll go with the two inch. It'll just give me a wider wheelhouse. So that clearance is not a problem. Now here, if we look at that wheel configuration, that's where my tire is going to sit in relation to the fender itself. That's not bad. If anything, I'd almost want it out just a little bit farther. But if that's where it wound up with, with uh, a six inch backspacing, I wouldn't be unhappy with that. I'm going to wait till I mount up the fronts to show you how this checker can be used to determine your wheel offsets but it doesn't really do me a lot of good on the back because I'm already touching back on the wheelhouse itself so that basically is the rears let me go ahead and dismount everything um, get the front set to go and let's take a look at the front moving up to the front what I've done so far kind of prep for this of course I've got the wheel and tire off but in order to actually articulate the suspension what i'm going to need to do is i need to remove the coil spring in order to do that probably have to take the shock loose take the sway bar at least loose on one side break the ball joint loose then take the coil spring out put everything back together at least uh loosely so that i can actually articulate this suspension well it fought me all the way but i succeeded i took the shock loose i've got the spring out which like i said Georgia clay, big old pile of it down there. I had to take the sway bar loose at the mount because the control arm is kind of dinged right there and I couldn't get to the bolts for the mount on the uh, control arm itself. But it doesn't matter. All of that's going to wind up being replaced anyway. So now that I've got the spring out, I can manipulate the suspension throughout its full travel. So let me get my tire set up, get my checker set on my tire, and let's take a look at what we got. So I've got my checker set up for my front wheel. Only difference I did this time, it's set up for a 9-inch wheel instead of a 12 on the rears, because that seems to be about, like, about what the tire wants. I'll still have to look and see if I can get a 20 by 9-inch wheel in the bolt pattern and the offset I need. We shall see. But, so I'm set up there and I'm set up again at zero offset or at, in this case, four and a half inch backspacing. So let me go ahead and get 
dismount it up. Get a couple lug nuts on. So we're getting tight. Now, let me go ahead and raise up the suspension to a little bit closer to what I'm hoping might be right height. Okay, so I got it raised up a little bit. However, I'm against the bump stop on the suspension already. And this is just about the beginning of where I kind of want that to be. I'm going to have to do a little bit of work on the suspension to lower Barney to the point where I want him to be. But this will give me a, a baseline idea. I may actually have to remove that bump stop so I can just continue right on up. But that's where it sits fairly close to what's going to be the right height. Uh, I'm still going to bring it a little bit closer, I think. And I've got good clearance so far here. I'm clearing all my suspension. I'm clearing everything back here. Let me run this through uh, left and right travel and see what it looks like. There's full lock to the right. And I've got tons and tons of room up in here. So there's no issue there. I'm not going to hit anything. Steering components, sway bar, nothing's going to hit there. So that's not a problem. So now I've got the tire full lock to the right. And let's take a look back here. I've still got tons of room everywhere. I got plenty of room. I'm not going to hit the shock, even though I'm putting coilovers, so that shock will go away. I got plenty of room up at the inner wheel well. So there's no problem here. And like I said, this is close to right height, so I still need to actually raise the suspension a little bit. Let me remove that bump stop and let's tr check this again. So I got the bump stop out. Let me crank it back up and see what that gives us. So I'm at my travel limits now. I'm not sure if that's mechanical. I think I might be hitting the, the uh, uh, limit on the ball joints where they just won't pivot anymore. That might be what's stopping me now. And let's run it through its travel and see if we hit anything. So that's at full compression. I've got tons of room in the wheel well. I'm not close to hitting anything at all there. I'm still looking really good at my fender well. Still plenty good there. Let me go the other direction and see what it looks like. All right. Same thing. Nothing's hitting. I got plenty of room everywhere. Not hitting any suspension components. I'm still good. Let me get the light in here so you can see. I'm still good for clearance with the inner fender liner and the fender itself. So that's good. Now let's play with the offset a little bit and see if that changes anything. All right, so I brought the tire back down to probably a little bit closer to what actual ride height is going to be. Let's play with the offset a little bit and see what kind of change that makes. So to give you an idea, right now, that's kind of where a zero offset tire, obviously I mean the suspension is a little bit uh, negative camber right now, but that kind of gives you an idea of where that tire is going to sit in relation to the, the fender. Let's say I wanted to bring this out a little bit with a different set of wheels. Let's uh, move it a little bit and see what kind of changes that, how that happens. So with my checker, the way I do that is, like I said, right now I'm at four and a half inches, which is basically zero offset. So let's say I wanted to bring the entire wheel and tire farther out. So that would give me, let's say I change it by let me try an inch. Let's see what happens there. So that would mean a three and a half inch backspace, or uh, that would technically be a, about a, a six millimeter, no, one inch, 25 millimeter 
negative offset. Let me make those changes real quick. Let's see what that does. So I went ahead and slid my entire wheel outboard by one inch. So instead of it being at four and a half, which is at zero offset, I moved it to three and a half inch backspacing, which is a negative 25, well, technically 25.4 offset, but call it 25, negative 25 offset. So let's see what that did for the look straight down the truck. Okay. So now what we've got is that moved the tire basically to right even, essentially, with the fender well. And let's just take it to full travel, just like we did before, and let's see if anything interferes. All right, again, I don't have any suspension interference. If you'll notice what it did, it brought it a whole heck of a lot closer to the fender liner itself, inner fender liner itself. Okay, so let's go the opposite lock and see what that did. Okay, so with opposite lock, basically I've got the same thing going. I'm a whole heck of a lot closer to my inner fender liner here. If I look back here, I've still got clearance back here. So I'm still good there. I've got clearance back here. So I'm still not going to hit anything. So at least I know kind of where my limits are. Because I can't really bring it out any farther because then I'm going to have interference here at the fender uh, edge itself. So at least it gives me an idea of where my limits are. Let's take and let's move it in an inch with positive offset and let's see what that does so i've got my checker readjusted and what i've done is i've moved the essentially the wheel center the wheel face out towards the front of the wheel if you want to call it that in other words i've got five and a half inches of backspace or 25 millimeters of positive offset so let's see what that does as far as the way the tire looks at ride height, approximately, and kind of how it performs as it goes through its suspension travel. So there, if you can kind of see that, that really tucks that tire up inside the wheel well, which at the ride height that I want, I personally, I don't like that. Um, if it was slammed down a little bit lower, that might look better. But to me, I just, I don't like the looks of it. But let's go ahead and run it to full compression. Or full, yeah, full compression. And let's run this thing through. See, we're still good clearance up everywhere there. But let's run this thing left and right lock and see what it looks like and see if it interferes with anything. So there is... Full right and full compression. I've got tons of room up here, so that's not a problem. However, I'm getting awfully close back here to some of my suspension components. I'm not interfering yet, but I am getting kind of close, and I don't have the shock mounted up. If you were running standard shocks on one of these, I don't think that offset would work very well. Let me go the opposite direction and see what it looks like the other way. Again, at full compression, I've got plenty of room here, plenty of room forward. I'm getting awfully tight back toward the inner side of the inner fender well, and I don't have any real suspension interference issues on this side, but that goes to show you what happens when you move that entire wheel in and out is you can kind of check and see where you might have some interference. So this gives me a pretty good idea. I'm going to get on the whiteboard real quick. I'm going to write some of this down before I forget it. And let's take a look at what my options are. I'll keep this quick, I promise. So let's start with the rear. We know the wheels are going to be 20 inches. Because of the tire, we know they have to be 12 inches wide. So I have a 20 by 12 wheel, but I still have to figure the offset. 
So on that one, I set the offset at zero or the backspace. So offset zero or the backspace six inches. Okay. Now I had interference at six inches with the uh, wheelhouse. But I'm going to replace the wheelhouses that will allow for wider tires. So wheelhouse actually is not a problem. Fender clearance also looked good. The one thing I couldn't do on the rears was I couldn't articulate the suspension for full compression to get an idea there. But I can get a fairly good idea based on just looks, essentially, because I don't have to move it through uh, a turning radius. Now let's talk about the fronts. Okay, on the front, again, it's a 20-inch wheel. I set the checker up for a nine inch width. I could go tens and I don't think that'll cause a problem, but the, the tire itself seemed to be more comfortable with a nine inch uh, wheel. So let me see what's available on a 20 by nine. So initially I set it up with zero offset or we checked it next with a negative 25 offset or a backspace of three and a half inches okay and the only thing that really changed was it moved the fender clearance a little bit closer that's the only real change on there i still had plenty of room everywhere next we had a 25 millimeter positive offset which equals a 5.5 inch backspacing and what that did is that move that actually pushed the entire wheel and and tire combination farther toward the center line of the truck okay i didn't like the look of this one and the clearance at the inner fender liner wasn't as good i know that this is kind of my limit here because i can't really because of the clearance on the fender i can't really go any farther than this so when i look for wheels my range is going to be on the fronts between these two. So from a zero offset to a minus 25 offset and on the rear, I can do the same thing. So what this does is this gives me a really good approximation of kind of where my wheels need to be in relation to the tires and the truck. Well, that's going to do it this week, guys. Got the Trailblazer uh, dissected disassembled torn down it's gone don't have to deal with that anymore i took off as much as i possibly could that i think i thought i could use picked up the tires for barney here i'm still working on wheels but at least now i know size width and potential offsets so i can start looking for wheels and uh, i've got everything set as far as all the parts and pieces and it's helping me kind of center where the the uh, build is going to go as i get to it certainly appreciate everybody watching big thanks to all you guys please like share and subscribe it really does help me out everybody have a great day